would, please grab a psalm book and turn to number 235. Number 235. Number 267. 267. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. 267. <coughs>
after the opening prayer will be number 85. Number 85. Good morning, this is Robbie Hughes speaking for the Church of Christ. We welcome you to our worship service. We appreciate our radio and TV audience and invite you to worship with us whenever possible. Our building is located at 4th and Magnolia in South Pittsburgh. Our visitors are asked to fill out a visitor card located on the back of the pew. Please drop this in the collection plate during this time. We meet each Sunday at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. for worship. We have Bible classes for all ages following our morning worship service. We also meet on Wednesday at 7 p.m. for Bible study. The purpose of the Church of Christ is to uphold the Bible as the Word of God and exalt Christ as the Son of God. We urge all to become Christians in a New Testament way. The CD or DVD of today's sermon is available free upon request by calling 837-6088. Others serving in the worship today are Elijah Gilbert, who is directing our singing. An open prayer will be led by David Francis. Our speaker today will be Ron Gilbert. Excuse me, the closing prayer be led by Andy Grider. There will be a teen singing today at 5 p.m. September the 2nd will be a singing at Rising Phone. It will be at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And then September the 4th there will be an elders meeting at 5 p.m. Uh, remember our gospel meeting October the 2nd through the 5th will be Roger Comstock will be the speaker. There will be dinner after Sunday school and group three will be in charge. The elders have asked to meet today <coughs> after class. Check the bulletin for a list of sick for the congregation. Remember Marion Grider, Larry Lockhart, and Larry Allen Lockhart. Uh, keep these in your prayers. Remember uh, Jeremy Jackson's father, Wesley Jackson, is in the hospital, and Ed Hill passed away. We now have an opening prayer. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, how will how would be their great name, hallowed. Father, we thank you so much for the for the privilege we have, for the freedom that we have in this earth today, in this country, as we we don't know that that you're just going to give us leaders that we deserve, and in the direction we're going, we may not deserve very much. But Father, help us to be stronger as we face the adversities that are surely coming to our the young children and to the people that are trying to striving to further your cause and to be a good influence and try to try to teach people around them and and all of the different diverse views that we have father help us to say the right things and behave ourselves in an appropriate way pleasing to you fathers we think about the work here at the church we thank you so much for the active leaders we have for the elders the deacons and the ladies that do so much the teaching and to work here to keep this an ongoing concern and we thank you for their effort and we ask you to bless their hearts and prayers as they try to make us a growing church we need to spread the gospel in this community uh, as all churches in the brotherhood do father be with the mission field we have where the people are much more receptive we thank you for we ask you to bless our finances the people and the decisions that our church is making and brotherhood as we try to decide how much support to give where the conversions are actually taking place and many more than we are locally and in this country. We thank you, Father, for, for this great effort, for the attitude of the people that are dedicated in their lives to go throughout the world and preach your word. Father, we ask you to be with the, the, with the Ron this morning as he presents a word of the truth. May he present the truth the way you would have him give it and understand it. May we all understand it, what you want us to get out of this message. Father, as we continue to worship this morning, we ask you to forgive our sins and help us to look forward to that great day as we try to think about the many sick and the older people and all our brotherhood here. We thank you and bless them and heal them if it be your will. Keep us forgiven and keep us strong, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
song of invitation will be number eight. Number eight. Brethren, friends, we are certainly glad that you're here. Man, the gangs are back. You guys are everywhere. It's good to have you here. See the Daniel and Tiffany Gaines from they're up in Bowling Green these days. And it's just good to have them with us anytime they can come. We're glad you're here. We're in Matthew chapter five, and we're looking at the last of Matthew chapter five as we have continued to study the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is recognized by even folks that are heathen <laughs> as being great teaching. That uh, you know that the principles set forth here, even people who didn't believe in the miracles of the Bible, who didn't really believe in the God of Heaven, as we come to know Him and realize who He is. Well, I'm talking about deists, the a lot of the uh, founding fathers of our country. They would even say those folks who don't believe that God's active, involved, and that Jesus was the Son of God. They would even say this is some of the greatest teaching that's ever been, if not the greatest. Matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson, who did not believe in the inspire, inspiration of the Bible, he didn't believe in the God of heaven as you and I. He believed in a higher power, but even he, he left the Sermon on the Mount pretty much intact in the chopped up Bible that he had called the uh, Jefferson Bible. If you ever get a chance, take a look at that, particularly where he stops with that. He stops right when they rolled the stone over the tomb. Didn't believe, of course, in the resurrection, but anyway. What we're trying to just acknowledge is even folks who don't believe in the God of the Bible say, you know what, that Sermon on the Mount is some good stuff. That is some good teaching. Of course, we know it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that what Jesus has been doing, particularly in the part we've been looking at, is trying to help us focus. And one of the things he's been acknowledging and showing is that the Pharisees have been anything but consistent with the way they have looked at the Bible. As a matter of fact, they emphasize certain parts and they would hold certain parts back. They were kind of like people that kind of look at Facebook today. If most of us probably have, or a lot of you have Facebook. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll get the next illustration. We're going to talk about a food bar. But in the Facebook, uh, you know, it's got that little stuff on the bottom there, you know, and you can kind of look at it, and you can say, man, I like that. And you can put the little thumbs up. Now they got a whole little list of things you can do. But you can put the thumbs up, you know, man, I really like that. And then there's parts that you're like, man, that's really good stuff. You know, I want to share that. And so you hit a little button, and you can share that. A lot of people look at the Bible like that. And, you know, there's, there's really nothing wrong with that. A lot of us do that, but you've got to be careful. And then there's parts of the Bible people just get upset about. I notice now they got a little emoji on there. You can uh, emoji. Well, anyway, it's a little symbol you can put up there that tells people whether or not you're, uh, you know, kind of red-faced and angry. You can do that. And a lot of people in the Bible, they look at it like that. There's parts that just make them angry they don't even want to talk about. And then there's parts of the Bible people just totally ignore. We see that happen all the time. And, yes... Unfortunately, you even have those who will unfriend the Bible. They just won't even look at it anymore. So a lot of people look at the Bible kind of like they do Facebook. If you're not familiar with Facebook, I know you probably know what a buffet is or a food bar. A lot of people look at it like that, and, you know, get a little bit of this, and I want a whole lot of that, and, boy, I don't touch that stuff over there. You know, I, I wouldn't come across that with a 10-foot pole. That's how people look at the Bible, and we got to be careful that we don't do that. We all do it to some degree. Poor, poor little old uh, <coughs> Rosemary. Rosemary likes to ask me a lot of times. Uh, she'll come up and she, you know, she loves to talk to me, and I love to talk to her. And she'll come up and she'll just ask me. She said, "Brother Gilbert, you know, what is your favorite part of the Bible?" She asked me that a lot. And bless her heart, she can't nail me down on anything because I always tell her whatever I'm studying. You know, if I'm studying Matthew, well, this is this is where I'm spending a lot of time. I really like the Book of Matthew, or if we've been in Psalms or something, I'll say, "Well, you know, this week it's the Book of Psalms." And, we you know, we all do that, the, the part that we're paying attention to, the part that we're familiar with. So, you know, to some degree, we all do that. But what we've got to be careful is that we don't get to the point where we just don't fool with the parts we're not fond of. You know, I know that the Bible says that, but I don't like that. Uh, you know, people do that with the Bible. Some parts of the, for instance, there's one fellow that was running around that had a problem with uh, Matthew's account of divorce and remarriage. And so in order to get rid of Matthew 19, he got rid of all four Gospels. <laughs> His name's Billingsley. He just said, hey, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John aren't even a part of the New Testament. And I thought, what in the world are they if they're not a part of the New Covenant? They were written after the death of Christ. They were, the, we call them the Gospels. We call them the, you know, the, uh, the life of Jesus Christ. But he did that because he felt the weight of Matthew chapter 5. He felt the weight of Matthew 19. 
And he didn't like it, so he needed to get rid of it somehow, so that's what he said. Well, that's not what you do with the Bible. You don't just take the parts you like and say, boy, we're really going to emphasize this. And boy, that part right there steps all over my toes, so we're going to totally ignore that. That's not what we do with Scripture. But you see, that's exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. You remember Jesus said, you've heard it was said. Now, this is not a contrast between the old law and the new law, even though what we're going to talk about today is more of a stretch, more of a stress towards what Jesus is moving to. But he's still going to show the fact that the scribes and the Pharisees haven't been consistent with what they said. You remember he began in, in verse, I think, what is it, 21, 22? He says in verse uh, 21, you have heard said. And he starts showing this contrast. And he says, thou shall not kill. But he says, we're going to, the law also says you're not supposed to hate. And so he emphasized that and said, you're getting one part of it, but you're not getting the other. The second example he'd show us was adultery. He'd say, they said, oh, you, you shouldn't commit adultery. But Jesus said it's deeper than that. It's lust. It starts in the heart. And, so, and he even showed them, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or his ass or his ox or any of his stuff. You, know, you don't need to lust after that because that's, that's where it begins. And it said that in the old covenant. He said, they're telling you this, but they're not emphasizing that. They're picking and choosing. He went on and talked about the writing of divorcement. Boy, they would just tell you straight up, man, you've got to have that writing. Whatever you do when you go get your divorce, you better give her that writing of divorcement. But Jesus says there's stuff on the other side of behind it. The reason behind the divorce. Deuteronomy 24, remember he talked about that. And this unclean thing. Number four, the, the idea of swearing. Jesus says they've told you, that, you know, when you swear, you better keep your oath. You better keep your promise. But they had abused that to the point they were swearing about everything. And he just simply said, it's losing its significance. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Swearing is for a special thing. It's for, we call them vows. When we get married, that is a special occasion. If you testify in a court, that is a, that's a special occasion. But if you're swearing all day long about everything, then it loses its significance. That's what Jesus was saying. Retaliation? They were saying, eye for an eye, buddy. You know, justice, where God's a God of justice. And Jesus is like, that's right. God's a God of justice. But at the same time, and we stress how he says twice in the book of Matthew, Matthew 9 and Matthew chapter 12, you need to go and understand what Hosea 6 and verse 6 means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You're stressing the justice of God, but you don't ever talk about Micah 6 and verse 8. You don't ever talk about mercy and grace. You're all about an eye for an eye, but there comes sometimes, remember, he, he gets after them. Matthew 23, you devour widows' houses. They wouldn't look at circumstances that were happening in a person's life. They just say, look, you agreed to pay this, pay me. And they didn't take into account that maybe she was sick or something of that nature. So he gets after them about that. Now, the part we're going to look at today, hate thine enemy? Jesus said, you have heard said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's going to say, he's going to show them they totally missed this. He totally missed this. And now he's going to stress, I tell you, love your enemy. You realize that's what uh, uh, the Old Covenant as well, uh, he's going to emphasize that. And once again, we're looking at, I think, maybe this, these last ten verses we've looked at, plus of Matthew chapter 7, some of the most understood yet most recognized passages of Scripture in all the Bible. People know exactly what Matthew 7, 1 verse says, but they have no idea, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, but they have no idea in context what it's talking about. Oh, you shouldn't judge. I shouldn't judge. I shouldn't judge when I'm put on a jury. You know, when I'm selected for jury duty, I shouldn't judge when I see a man kill another man and say, well, you know, that's wrong. I shouldn't judge when a man's breaking in my house, threatening my family. I, I should, of course you should. Jesus said in John chapter 7, judge righteous judgment. But see, there's a context there, and the context he means he's talking about is that hyperbole we've been talking about. Cut off your right hand, you know. Uh, don't try to pick out the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a big log hanging out of yours. That's exaggeration. And we talk about how these folks have become so extreme and how that sometimes Jesus would use these extreme type hyperbole words and actions and, and descriptions to try to shock them back into saying, boy, you know, we really are kind of stressing this way more than we should. We, we're not balanced. And that's exactly what he's doing here. And like we said, there are many parts of this. And this idea of love your enemies, what exactly is Jesus talking about here? What's he saying? Well, in Matthew chapter 19 at verse 8, notice the Bible says, the second part there, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Notice with me in verse 43, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor. Jesus doesn't have a problem with that. 
He agrees totally with that. Just like these other things. Jesus is not saying that's bad scripture or that's not, that's not right. He's saying, yes, you've heard this. This has been taught, but this also has been taught. And here he's going to show that they're teaching something that's not even in there. Love thy, notice he says, love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But Jesus says, but I say unto you, love your enemy. Now, what's he talking about there? Let's go over, for instance, in Exodus chapter 23. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5. And he gives some illustrations. This is God, the old covenant, telling Israel how it, what it means to love somebody, how you love folks. He says, thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray. Now, this is a day and age when we might say if you see your, your buddy's truck or something, it's something that's a work animal, it's something that you needed to use tractor. This is something they used. This was money. This was an investment. This cost somebody something. They were important part of life. It'd be just like today you see somebody's tractor out in the field uh, run into a tree or something all by itself. Something You know, you just put that in kind of today's language. If thou meet thine enemy, this is an enemy. This is somebody that doesn't wish you well and, you know, you're not particularly fond of either. If you see your enemy's ox or his ass going astray, in other words, you, you see that animal, you recognize it, thou shalt surely bring it back again. Bring it back to him again. Now notice verse 5. If thou see the ass of him that lieth thee, or hateth thee, notice this guy hates you, lying under his burden. Now these animals were pack animals. You know, a lot of times they would load them down. You know, they wanted to make less trips. You know, you can appreciate that, but sometimes they'd overload them. And a lot of times these animals, they knew where to go. You know, they'd go to their barn or their crib or whatever. And so this animal goes, and it's, it's under its burden. Notice what the Bible says, lying under his burden. Now notice, and would his forebear to help him. You think, I know whose animal that is. I recognize that animal. That's old so-and-so. You know, I don't care a whole lot about him, and I know he don't care much about me. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he hates me. He does everything he can. There's a temptation there. There's that thing in the back of your mind that's saying, well, I don't care if that animal gets back or not. As a matter of fact, I hope something happens to it. I hope he can't get up. He deserves everything he gets. God says, and would his forbear to help him? That's what you're thinking, but don't you do that. You do what's right. You show compassion on that animal. You show compassion on that friend. Thou shalt surely help with him. Now, folks, that cuts against the grain. That means I'm going to try to be a bigger person than I, than I am, than you know I want to be. A lot of times it means I've got to do something that I don't want to do. Now, these are everyday, maybe not everyday situations, but situations you might find yourself in. You have an opportunity to help. You have an opportunity to do good to somebody, and they don't even know it. Both of these, it doesn't say anybody's watching. Here's this animal just walking down the road. You realize it's gotten out. You have an opportunity here. You don't have to do it. But God said, here's this opportunity. You know that's the right thing to do. Do it. Another situation, you're here. Nobody sees you. That animal's under its load. Can't get up. And you can just ignore it. In fact, that might be what you want to do. But God said, don't do that. You, you help that animal out. This is rising up. This is doing what is right. Rising up to do what is right. People today in our country, I'm afraid, they don't even know what that means. They don't care about other people's feelings. They don't care about other people's property. Sometimes they'll destroy property just for the fun of it. Just to say, oh, I wonder what they're going to do without that now. Just take away something from somebody else. Many times, not so they can enjoy it, just so they cannot enjoy it. Some people get pleasure out of the fact that they're taking something from somebody. Isn't that amazing? But I think that's what we have a big trouble with today, a lot of trouble. And it comes from the fact that people don't know what to do. They don't, know, they don't think about doing right. They don't have respect for each other. They don't have the kind of love that we're going to talk about this morning. Watching a program not too long ago, I have on here killing each other for a cell phone. They didn't even kill each other for a cell phone. A man shot and killed another man and his girlfriend <coughs> because they had just alleged that he had took her phone. <coughs> Do you believe that? Two lives were taken Oh, first of all, over a cell phone. I don't care if it's an iPhone 6 Plus. It, it's something, you know, it's not that big a deal. That's replaceable. Just money, a few dollars. And here you just had somebody's pride. And people will kill each other over. It happens all the time. People don't care about other people anymore. And why should they? If you believe what's talking to, if you believe what is taught in the public schools, if you believe what our tax dollars are helping brainwash our children with, that in reality, we're nothing more than a bunch of cockroaches that just happen to go up the right side of the food chain, and we happen to be at the top of it, then why would you? 
And see, that's one of the basic problems of this country. And until we decide to get back to the root of the problem and fix that, we're going to continue to get this rotten fruit that this tree is bearing. But we, I don't know that we have the guts to do that. I appreciate Brother Francis's prayer. I think we're just, just content to let things go as it is as a country as long as I'm getting mine. I tell you what, there's going to come a point in time when you're going to get yours and you're not going to want it. We need to fix this now. We need to teach young people, you were created in the image of God. It's important what you do in this life. Your brothers and sisters in the flesh, I'm talking about other people in the community, they're created in the image of God. They're important. They're significant. You need to help each other out, not tear each other down, not kill one another. Absolutely amazing. The Bible teaches I need to be a bigger person. I need to do what's right. What is the best for your soul? My soul. See, we're talking, we just left the realm of what we were talking about a second ago. We're talking about things now that our country doesn't even acknowledge. The idea of a soul? We're bugs. We're nothing more than Darwin's theory in action. You don't have a soul. You're no different than a dog or a cat. You don't believe that's right. Watch the news. A lot of times you'll see more coverage on a group of puppies than you will see on a, on a bunch of children. You'll see more emphasis placed on an animal's life than a human life. We want to save the whales and we kill the babies. Now, brethren, there's something wrong with that. And until we're big enough people to say, you know what, this is a problem. We don't recognize the difference between a human being or an animal. We're going to continue to eat the fruit of this rotten tree. I hope that uh, our country will turn it around, brethren. But I, I'm, I'm, not cons I'm, not, I'm not real sure about that. Notice, he who hates you, would is forbear to help him? That's not what I want to do. Sometimes you have to overcome your feelings. You know what you want to do? Well, that fella right there, he's always trying to get me. This is an opportunity. Why do I care whether his animal dies or not? You don't want to do it, but you've got to overcome your feelings. Today, cause me discomfort? Me go out of my way to help that guy? No way. I'm not going to do that. And Jesus is right here saying we're going to do that. We need to do that. But I say unto you, the Bible said this. Notice Proverbs 25, 21. If thine enemy be hungry, by the way, Paul quotes this. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Now here's the part you remember. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to help hurt him. The idea of the coals of fire there. Remember when you were younger and your conscience maybe was a little bit softer and you got embarrassed or you were ashamed of something? Remember that? How your face might just fluster up. You ever seen the, sometimes you can do that with young children today. You start talking about being boy kisses or something. I remember when we first started coaching softball, one of the tools my, we coached a little girls team. One of the tools my cousin would use, he'd, he'd call them boy kissers if they didn't hit the ball hard or something, you know. And boy, at that age, that just, they'd turn all red and everything. They'd get upset, you know. They, that's what this is talking about here. You're going to, this guy, you're going to treat him right. Even though he hates you, even though he's done everything he can to do whatever he can against you, and here you are treating him good. You're going to make that fellow ashamed. And, he's, and with that, you just might get him to think about the way and his attitude towards you and the way he treats you. And he may look at what you're doing for him and saying, you know what, I've, I've been, a, I've, I really stink. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't be like that to that fellow. Here I am down like this, and he's helping me. He's showing me this kind of kindness. And if the fellow's got any kind of salt about him whatsoever, he'll take a moment, he'll think about that. So, you know, I need to change my attitude. That's what this is talking about here. Make him rethink about how he's treating you. He who hates you. Life is not always about what makes me happy. That's another problem we've got with our younger generation. We just think that everything ought to make me happy. That's what everything's about. Jesus says, love your enemies. Think of the context once again. This is not somebody breaking into your house. This is not somebody coming in trying to kill you. Okay? You have a right to defend yourself. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Where Jesus even told his disciples, go out and buy swords. The time's going to be you're going to have to have one. You can defend yourself. That's not what this is talking about. This is also, friends, brethren, not, not somebody that's been, that, you know, somebody that's convicted of murder. They're on death's row. And sure enough, you'll have some preacher somewhere that takes this out of context. And he'll get a group of people together. And they'll go protest the state bearing the sword. Because uh, they bear it not in vain, Romans 13. And they'll say, oh, no, we shouldn't kill people. We shouldn't kill people. We, we're supposed to love our enemies. 
Well, now, friends, this is not talking about the states executing prisoners. What this is talking about is a, is a city. Now, think about this. The very same law that Jesus is quoting. In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, the patriarchal, the very foundation, says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man's hand shall his blood be shed. The very same law, when it got to the mosaical economy, had no less than, I think, a dozen capital crimes where people were to be put to death. This is not talking about executing folks who are worthy of death. Remember what Paul said. If I have done something worthy of death, I refuse not to die. That's not what this is talking about. No, there are certain things that the government should be doing. And one of those things is protecting me and you. And the death penalty is a serious, serious deterrent. If you don't believe me, look at the capital, rate, capital crime rate from Texas to, say, California. You'll see a lot of people realize if they do something in a certain area, they're going to be punished for it. That's not what this is talking about at all. But not introducing something new here. He is telling them, you've been misled. You've been mistaught. It's not okay to, to hate your enemies. And he's teaching them what the law really taught. And now he's going to emphasize it even more. And people ask, and I mean rightfully so, they'll ask me and you, how in the world are you supposed to love your enemies? Really? Love your enemies like you love your children? Like you love your spouse? This guy is doing everything he can to cause you pain and, and getting your, you know, just, just ugly to you. And you're just supposed to run up and hug him and embrace him and just, oh, you know, that, that. No. No, that's not what this is talking about today. But see, a lot of times, particularly in our country, we equate this word love with feelings all the time. The Greeks have no less than four words that deal with love. We'll talk about those very quickly. There's eros, which is a, a sexual love, say, between a husband and a wife. That's never used in Scripture. You have the word storgi, storgi which is uh, not used by itself, but is attached with other words. kind of has the idea of, a, of a <clears throat> like a family love. Then you have phileo, <clears throat> which deals with basically like a brotherly love. Then you have this... Uh, friendly love. Then you have this agape love. Now this agape love, now sometimes these words are used interchangeably. It's language, you know. I'm not saying this, this is a clear-cut definition every single time. But this agape love, this, is, this love is so big and it covers so much that it can even involve how you treat your enemies. This idea of love your enemies. That's when you set aside your own desire, your own will for the betterment of somebody else. Somebody that is your enemy. How you can treat them the way that's right. The way that's right. And I'm not saying they come up and hit you. You need to turn the other cheek. We talked about that last week. That's an exaggeration. Even Jesus, when he was struck, said, why did you hit me to the soldier that did that? What we're talking about here is doing what's in the best interest for somebody. And I mean in their best interest. Sometimes that means you're going to say something that's going to hurt somebody's feelings. may make them mad. You may lose a friendship because you love that person. And you want them to know that what they're doing is wrong. The loving thing to do is to tell them about their sin. Tell them about when they're wrong. A lot of people don't want to do that. Oh, I just love them too much. No, you don't love them enough. You don't love them enough. People equate love with feelings, and that's not always right. Now, don't, get, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Many times in the Bible, when you see the word love, it's talking about that very thing, feelings. Sometimes it's called, uh, like for parents, natural affection, twice in Scripture, once in Timothy and once in the book of Romans. It's a natural affection. That's something that, that is a feeling. But sometimes this word is attached when it carries with it the idea of doing what is right. It is a love of the will. It is a love of choice. It is a love of decision. It's not just like, well, I really care about that person. You know, I got these feelings for them. And many times, people don't understand that. This love we're talking about, the love of the head, not necessarily the love of the heart. This makes you go in one direction and do something that you'd rather go in the other. I don't really want to go help that animal. That guy it treats me awful. Why do I want to go help him? It's the right thing to do. It is a love of choice. It's a love of decision. I'm going to say what's right. I'm going to do what's right. Even though there's a part of me that really wants to lash out and say this or that, I'm going to be the bigger person here. I'm going to be the better man. I am going to do what is right. And brethren, we need this in all aspects of our life. We need this in our home. We need this when it comes to setting up a home. You need to do what's right. What do I mean by that? Think about marriage for a moment. 
Marriage is about doing what's right. It's not so much about those little butterfly feelings that you have for each other when you when you first meet and you're dating, and because those fla- those feelings are going to dissipate, and they're going to change. And I'm not saying you don't still have the affection for your mate. I'm not saying that at all. But that can't be all that the marriage is based upon. What do I mean by that? When I went in the army, I've told you about this. I was gone four years, came back. Many of the people I went to high school were on their second marriage. They had said, I do, and they didn't. You know, they did not. They, they said, I'm going to have this kind of concern. I'm going to do what's right, and they didn't. Well, what, what do we mean by that? Sometimes marriage is, is, is you're going to have to do what's right. You're going to have to make a commitment. It's not just all about feelings with your children. I came from a situation where I had somebody telling me, you know, I love you, I love you, but every action they did was the opposite of that. You know, your dad didn't say, look, I love you, son, and then walk out the door and then come back. He didn't say, I'll be there Saturday at 6 o'clock, and then doesn't show up week after week after week. Now, you may have all the great fluffy feelings in your heart you ever want to have, but that's not love, friends. That's not love, brethren. Love or actions where you say, I'm going to do the right thing, and maybe I don't have time to go today, but you know what? I'm going to go because I said I was going to be there. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to raise my children. I'm going to love my wife. I'm not going to do this because that would hurt my family. It is a decision. And sometimes they're not decisions you want to make. Sometimes they're like, do you not know the Falcons are playing at 1 o'clock? Why in the world do we need it? Sometimes you've got to go do something that you'd rather not do because it's the right thing to do. you got decisions. It's, a, it's your children. And we understand this with kids. Those of you that have children, you love your kids. But is there not some time where you'd like to pinch your little heads off? <laughs> what are you doing? We all go through that. But you have made a decision. You have made a commitment. You say, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to raise my children. I'm going to do the best that I can by them. That's this type of love we're talking about. There is a constant temptation to be selfish. There is a constant temptation, a constant battle. You'll be fighting it from henceforth. And you see what happens is that philo kind of love we're talking about, that, that feeling love starts to dissipate in a marriage, the spouses say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do what I want to do. This really means something to me. And how we used to put everything aside for our mate because we had those little fluttery feelings, they're not so strong anymore. So now we're like, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. No, that's not what this type of love we're talking about does. This type of love puts aside self for the betterment of the love of the you know the, the people together we need more of this love in the church brethren man do we need this you know as we spend time together over a period of time as a congregation you know how this goes you spend time at a place you start to know each other you know what it makes each other go what makes each other tick and then sometimes somebody you cannot like somebody a whole lot you know you have your friends and then there's the folks you don't know then there's folks that you don't really get along with and you know what makes them go you know what flips their switches and sometimes you'll find yourself being tempted to, to say that or do that just because you know it gets under the skin. That happens in a church family just like it does in a real live physical family where you have siblings and all you siblings out there that have brothers and sisters, don't tell me you don't know what, uh, what I'm talking about. You know exactly what buttons to push. You know exactly how to get the other sibling in trouble because you know what riles them up. That's a part of it. That can happen in the church too. And we can go cold. We can go inconsiderate of each other. And we don't have the patience that we once did. Now, some people handle this differently. Some folks just say, you know what? I'm going to change congregations. I'm just tired of them folks over there. I can't get along with them anymore. And so basically what we do is we go and we start another honeymoon somewhere. You know? It is so easy to love and like people you don't know. Isn't it? Hey, he's a good fellow, man. This is a good church. I, I don't know any of these people. But, boy, they are all friendly to me today. But over the years, as you start to get to know each other, that gets to be harder and harder. It's easy to like people when you don't know them. It takes a lot of effort to stay together. And you start having to realize, you know, and just like in a family, some people are strong over here, the weak over here. Some people get on the nerves here. Some people don't. I've got to be patient with folks. I've got to love them. Do the right thing. We need all this. Why? Verse 45, that you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. What do you mean, Jesus? For he maketh the sun to rise on his people, and he don't let those, those sinners over there 
those evil people have any son? No. What does God do? He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. The rain, he gives it to the just and to the unjust. God's good to everybody. And you are of your father, God. So you need to treat people right. God, that's what Jesus says. You need to treat people right. Well, I love my own. This is my little circle right here. This is my box. I treat everybody in this box good. Jesus said, ain't good enough. That ain't good enough. Verse 46. For if you love them that love you, what reward have you? In other words, what good is that? Don't the sinners, don't people outside in the world do that very thing? Don't they treat those that like them better? Isn't that how it works? Jesus says you've got to do better. That's easy. Verse 47. If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publican so. Be ye therefore perfect. That's where it gets tough. That's where the rubber meets the road. This idea of being perfect. I want to stop here for just a second. We'll spend a few moments here. That clock back there is four minutes fast, by the way, if you are looking. What do I mean? Perfect has the idea of being complete. It does not mean that you are sinless. Now, there's some folks that's called perfect in the Bible, and they were by no means sinless. Noah is referred to as being perfect. It means complete. It means upright. He's, he's balanced in his life. You see what we're talking about, the scribes and the Pharisees? They had issues in other places. They would emphasize this and show everybody how holy they were, but when it came to mercy and love and things of this nature, they weren't anywhere they needed to be. They weren't complete. They were not perfect. The Bible here, Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What do I mean by that? Sometimes you may have a fella that's not what he ought to be. He seems to be real great at church and everything. He's friendly with everybody. When he gets home, he doesn't, doesn't treat his wife right. She's not perfect. He's not complete. You may have a fella that, uh, man, he's, he's actively involved. You know, he does, you know, he, as far as you know, he's a good guy. But he gets to work, and he's mouse like a sailor. Uh, any of you sailors in here, I'm, you know, that's just an old <laughs> way of explaining. Uh, doesn't talk. He uses a lot of colorful metaphors. He's not what he ought to be. He's not perfect. See, what we're trying to do is be perfect, trying to be complete, and trying to look at everything evenly. Don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees, emphasize one thing, just totally forget about something else. We're trying to be per perfect. Noah is described as perfect and walked with God. Uh, Abraham is described as perfect, Genesis 17, 1. Uh, Job, perfect and upright, Job 1, verse 1. These were men that were not perfect, sinless, but were doing the very best that they could conscientiously to be what they needed to be be what God would have them to be. That's the idea of perfect here. Not lacking. Just one area of their life they're just not fooling with. Brethren, think about that for a moment. It, it causes me to think. I've got a good friend I think a lot of. I listen to him preach a lot. And he, he was going over this very thing the other day. And he was talking about how guy worked real hard over here but he, but he wasn't treating his wife like, like he ought to. And I thought about that, and I immediately texted my wife. She can tell you it was the other night. And I said, uh, I just want you to know how much I love you and how much I, how thankful I am for you and how much I appreciate you. It caused me to stop and think for a minute. I don't think that I mistreat my wife, but there's times that I don't treat her as bad. As I really like her. I, you know, for those of you, uh, we hang out together a lot. She means a lot to me. But sometimes I, I don't tell her that. And I'm not saying that you don't do that, or, but it just... Think about the roundness of your life, your totality of your life, things you could do better, things that maybe you don't. Being perfect has with it the idea of trying to be round, doing all the right things. I know that's difficult. You can't be perfect. But don't just let something lack. Don't not emphasize the small things. that Because when it comes to your family, when it comes to the way we treat each other in the congregation, these are some of the most important things in your life. And it's not your job. One of these days, they're going to get rid of you. You know, you're going to retire or whatever. And then you go back in, and it's like they don't even want to talk to you anymore. You know, it's, you don't have a place anymore. It, but your family, your church family, these are, these are significant things that I think sometimes we don't, we don't stress as we should. Jesus says, basically, get outside your box. Now, the box is where we're comfortable. What do you mean get outside my box? Talk to other people. Spread your influence. Don't just salute your brethren. Don't just salute your family. Talk to other folks. Spread your influence. Be, let that little light shine everywhere that you go. 
In Matthew 5, brethren, you, you've seen what we've looked at here from being poor in the Spirit all the way here to love your enemies. Jesus is saying, he's raising the bar on us. I don't care who you are. This sermon, it runs on you. It runs on you because you're like, Phew. Jesus is saying, I need to be here. And right now, man, I'm thinking I'm down here. You know, I've got, I've got to do some in all of us. If you're feeling that way this morning, you are not alone. I'm right there with you. There are things that I could be doing better that I don't, that I'm going to try to do better. That's why we're studying this, to try to focus, try to focus in on what Jesus is telling us. Jesus says, this is good. You shouldn't commit adultery. You shouldn't murder. But he says, this is better. Get rid of the lust in your heart. And then finally, this is best. Not only get the lust out of your heart, but try to help other people be the kind of family they ought to be. Try to have the influence on them and the encouragement on them. This is good. This is better. Christianity said, let's do what's best. Let's get outside. Let's raise that bar. Scribes and Pharisees, just not perfect. Just not complete. Remember what Jesus said, unless your righteousness shall exceed. So these guys were picking and choosing. We don't need to do that. Friends, God's good to us. Shouldn't we be what he wants us to be? Perfect and complete. And let me tell you something. You can't, you're not going to be sinlessly perfect. You know, you're not going to live a life where you never sin, even until you become a Christian. It ain't going to happen. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make matters and you know, errors in judgment from time to time. You'll have passion sometimes and maybe make decisions that later on you'll regret. That happens. But if you're not a child of God, you're not a Christian, you've not never obeyed the gospel, what do I mean by that? I mean you have repented of your sins, you have named Christ before men as believing that he indeed is the Son of God, that God has raised him from the dead, and you haven't been baptized, there you're not even close to complete. You know, you're incomplete. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God, keep his commandments, you're not doing that. You haven't even really started on this journey of being what God would have you to be. So a step in being complete or perfect would be to obey the gospel. But maybe in times past you've done that. But boy, you realize there's some things I need to work on. If it's of a public nature, then we encourage you to take care of that. Don't let that sit around. But if it's something that's not, if it's just something that's private, then you take care of that. As we sing this song, you can pray to God for forgiveness for that. And then there may be those here who just simply need the prayers of the church, want to make a public announcement. Look, Lord, would you forgive me? Would you take care of me? Brethren, I need your prayers. We, we stand ready to help you in any way that we possibly can. And together we stand and sing. Forgive.